the reason I chose Center for Advanced Legal Studies is because I found out it was an accredited program. Welcome, everyone. You are entering a field that you're going to be proud to be part of and in which you can develop a complete career. They started in one area and then went to another area. It's about creating value and doing good things. Now that's versatility when you can do that in a career. Congratulations.
Good morning. My name is Tammy Riggs, and I'm the Director of Outreach and Career Services. My role is to educate, advise, and connect students to opportunities post-graduation. I look forward to working with you all, and I extend my warmest congratulations to everyone receiving certificates and degrees. To the faculty, staff, and our online participants and guests around the country who have joined us for the webcast of this ceremony, thank you for participating. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Center for Advanced Legal Studies Virtual Graduation and Achievement Recognition. This is our 67th commencement since 1988. We have been supporting, encouraging, and molding paralegals for over 30 years. Recognizing student accomplishments never gets old. However, the joy it brings, particularly in these difficult times, means even more. It is easy to feel buried by our circumstances. One year into this pandemic and the world is still messy. Many have been touched catastrophically by this virus. It was not what any of us had planned. It's definitely an experience that will affect our lives forever, and it is a memory that we will never forget. But we are made from our experiences and our memories. So my challenge to all of you is not to feel buried by this situation. Instead, realize that the pain and heartache that has been piled upon you can still plant you in a way that will allow you to grow and prosper into who you are meant to be. Everything that you have been through up to this point makes you who you are, and the best part is you are not done yet. You have amassed experiences that will look good to a hiring manager, and you have taken classes that will give you the skills you need. You should feel a tremendous sense of pride. As you move forward and embark on the next big journey of your life, whether that's an advanced degree, the workplace, or something else, know that you had to face a multitude of barriers. You are all here today despite numerous setbacks and obstacles, and this will surely enable you to persevere stronger than ever. To the family, friends, and loved ones who have supported you, thank you for the encouragement you have offered, and in many cases for the sacrifices you have made. You have been a tremendous help, tolerating late nights of homework and studying as your graduates balanced jobs, family, and educational goals. We appreciate your support. In recognizing hard work, dedication, and overcoming obstacles, I would like to make note of the graduates with superior academic performance. To earn the LEX designation indicated in the slideshow, graduates must have maintained 95% attendance and a 3.9 grade point average. LEX is the National Honor Society sponsored by the American Association for Paralegal Education. Graduates with 100% attendance and a 4.0 grade point average receive an additional honors designation through CALS. CALS also recognizes our veteran graduates for defending the freedoms that we all enjoy every day. It is an honor to pay tribute to Shatoria Hunt, Nicole Rittner, and Teresa Chan. We are certainly thankful for your service and proud of you for it. Mr. Swanson began his legal career in 1971 as a candidate in the United States Air Force Legal Services Specialist Training Program. That would be paralegal to you and me. Mr. Swanson was trained as a court bailiff, criminal court administrator, court reporter, claims examiner, and investigator. Mr. Swanson served in this capacity until 1976 when his active duty service was completed. He was awarded the Air Force Commendation Medal for Outstanding Service in Asia. After serving in the Air Force, Mr. Swanson enrolled in the University of Florida in September of 1976. Go Gators! He graduated with his bachelor's degree in June of 1978, earning his four-year degree in less than two years. Wasting no time, Mr. Swanson enrolled at South Texas College of Law and graduated in 1981 with his Doctor of Jurisprudence and began practicing law in Houston with a focus on maritime law, personal injury law, and labor and employment law. Mr. Swanson opened his trial practice firm in 1986 and expanded his trial practice to include criminal law and family law. He continues his private trial practice to this day. Mr. Swanson began teaching paralegal students at Center for Advanced Legal Studies in 1987. He was the very first instructor to teach at CALS and he will have completed his 34th year of teaching just a few days from now. In 2000, Mr. Swanson was appointed academic dean and has served in that capacity for the past 20 years. All said, 2021 will mark Mr. Swanson's 50th year working in law and his 40th year as a practicing attorney. 
Mr. Swanson has educated, trained, and inspired thousands of paralegals at Center for Advanced Legal Studies and maintains contact with many long after they have graduated and started their paralegal careers. His no-nonsense approach, riveting lectures, and practical advice has long made Mr. Swanson a favorite of students. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Mr. Thomas B. Swanson, JD, Academic Dean, Center for Advanced Legal Studies. Good morning, graduates, families, and friends. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, and I wanna start out by telling each and every graduate, you know, congratulations. You've accomplished something significant. And really that's what makes graduation special. It's, it's, a, it's a long standing ritual. Uh, going back, interestingly enough, to the 13th century, in which achievement is celebrated. And I'm sure that your families and friends are incredibly impressed and proud of you. And so I wanted to add my voice to that, you know, congratulations to you. I wanted to make some comments today uh, that I think you might find useful down the road. Uh, the, these are, you know, comments, uh, suggestions, maybe even some stories. Um, the first thing I want you to be aware of is, is that when you achieve something like this, when you graduate, you know, new doors open. And you're going to be confronted with choices and opportunities, and that's great. What you want to do is make the choice and seek the opportunity that works best for you. The legal career field is wonderful in that regard. There are so many different kinds of legal employment. And you're going into a field which needs you. It doesn't want you, it needs you, okay? There's so much going on in the law today uh, that it's imperative that we bring in more and more paralegals. One of the things a lot of people don't realize is that law is a dynamic thing. It is constantly being affected by uh, the forces of new technologies and social evolution. So, for example, every time we, we create a new technology, then the, the people creating the new technology don't call lawyers and say, what are we gonna do? And we've got a new technology. It doesn't work like that. New technologies happen. And when they happen, uh, many times there are some excellent results. Technology can be a wonderful thing. But as we all know, technology can be used for bad things. And so it takes the government time to identify those things and then new laws come about. Uh, when, I was, when I was first working in the law, terms like hacker, we had no idea what that was. Uh, we didn't know what social media was. We'd never heard of it before because it didn't exist. Um, in fact, when I started in the law, there were no ATM machines. There were no, uh, there were no cell phones. It was a different world at that time. And so my point is, as the technology has advanced, as social evolution occurred, by that I mean things like the, the fact that uh, you have situations where you have uh, uh, female single head of households uh, increasing and increasing beginning in the 1960s. So, you know, things evolve from the, the uh, two parent family often, and it was critical that the that the uh, the mother, the female, oftentimes be able to be able to work, to be able to work, and, and to be able to work full time. There was a time not that long ago where uh, women were paid less, and the argument was, well, the thing is, is she's just supplementing her husband's income. Well, the world's changed an awful lot since then, and as a result, the laws have changed. The laws have been changed to to help accommodate the ability of single parents to work. So that's what I mean by social evolution. Another example is, you know, the, 
same gender marriage issue, which, you know, uh, which has gotten into the courts and there's been some major changes involved. So my point is, is law to some degree is always chasing its tail. And so the law keeps evolving and evolving. And uh, it's critical that we continue to get new people into the field, get diverse people into the field, you know, to help do what needs to be done. Now, when I say do what needs to be done, you need to understand that it's all about the client. It's not about the paralegal. It's not about the lawyer. It's about the client. When you go into the legal career field, you're there to help people. I point this out to you because it's good to know that, and I say this often to my students, is that you are not there to judge your clients. You are there to help your clients. I make this point to you because having been a paralegal and having been a lawyer, uh, I can tell you that one of the differences, there's a lot of similarities, but one of the differences is, as a paralegal, you don't get to pick the client. That's oftentimes done by, by the lawyers. Sometimes it can be done by, you know, agency referrals or court appointments, but basically it's the lawyers that make these decisions and not the paralegal. So if you're going to go work in an environment uh, and, and you are concerned about, you know, what kind of clients would you have? Well, you need to think about that. So, for example, if you work in criminal law, well, guess what? You're going you're gonna to encounter some criminals, uh, while a vast majority of people that, that are prosecuted are not career criminals or dangerous people per se. Nevertheless, it might be something that you're very uncomfortable with. You would probably want to know that on the front end. So you need to think about these different situations that you might find yourself in. So if you're, if you're for example, if you're interested in criminal law, you're going to encounter criminals. If you are interested in family law, well, you're going to see people in crisis. So it's important to give thought to what is it that you want to do? What is it that you want to happen? What is the trajectory that you want to take as you go into this career field? And the good news is there's so many choices. Uh, it's, it, I'm sure that there's something for just about everybody. I used to play a game with, with students about, you know, matching your existing skills up with uh, your job as a paralegal to enhance your situation. And I, I had a student raise his hand and he says, I don't know if, if I would be very, be very good as a paralegal. I mean, I don't even like people that much. And I remember telling him, well, there's always probate. They're dead, you know. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is that the point is, is that you, you might not be a people person. You might not be, want to deal with people in crisis. OK, uh, there's still many types of positions and you can be a, a great help and of great value. But you've got to give it some thought on the front end. Um, now, I want to talk for a little bit uh, about the job itself. What kinds of advice, uh, suggestions, uh, I like to give people who are going into the paralegal field. And I have mentored a number of lawyers, and so I also say this about people who, who are new lawyers. Um, first of all, make yourself useful. Try to find ways to make yourself useful. Many times when you go to a new job, you know, there are natural trust issues. I mean, the, the affairs of the client are very important. So you might not just be given high responsibilities immediately when you start. That doesn't mean that you can't become helpful. I encountered this when I was a paralegal student. And uh, 
it's hard to believe it was in 1971. And uh, I tested uh, along with a group of other people to see who would be selected to this paralegal program. And it turned out that I was the only one who didn't have a college degree. A couple of the other people that were ultimately selected had a year of law school. And not only that, I wasn't even a great high school student, but I did do, I did do well in taking tests. So I get into this training program and I had never worked in an office before. I had no idea about the office environment. Uh, I certainly wasn't nearly as educated as everybody around me. And so you can imagine it, what it must feel like. Uh, I didn't feel insecure. I felt lucky, you know, because there were worse jobs and worse situations you could get in the military during wartime. But I started thinking about the importance of being that I was going to be committed to four years in the military, I wanted to come out better than I was when I went in. And so it all started when I got the keys to the office they gave each of the, the, uh, the students that would be receiving education and training in the program, keys to a large active law office. And so this is where I fell in love with the law library. I go in the law library and I see all these books. And I was just fascinated. I mean, it reminded me of the library I'd seen on a legal TV show one time and how I was amazed at how big these books were and how many of them there were and so forth. And so what I started doing, realizing that I was essentially inferior to just about everybody there, was I would go in about two hours, two and a half hours before the, the duty day started and I would pull books from the library and start reading them. These were what were called case reporters, which I didn't know at the time. And it was, as most of you know, that there are times where there's a, a result in a case and someone says, I'm going to appeal. I disagree with the decision and so forth. You hear that a lot. Well, what isn't as well known is, is that for about 900 years, uh, appeal courts have existed and they have issued written opinions on the cases that they have reviewed. And so that, you know, in every state in the United States, they have uh, case books which have the opinions of the state appeal courts. And then there are the federal appeal courts. Well, the, the books I started reading were on military appeals, appeals of court martials. And they went back to World War I and all this sort of thing. And I would read every morning for a couple of hours. It was fascinating. I mean, it, it took time, but I began to realize the thing about these case reporters was it was all about real things that happened to real people. So when I would come in in the morning, what I would, what I would do is I, I started fixing the coffee there. This was the days where they had these percolators. They didn't have Mr. Coffee and they didn't have Starbucks and that sort of thing. And I had learned as part of my chores at home to make coffee in the morning for my parents, you know, and that sort of thing. And so in the morning I would get there and, and they had these huge percolators and I would put on the coffee. Well, unknown to me, uh, the people would come in in the morning and they would be kind of cranky because Normally, the coffee didn't get put on until about 7, 15, 7, 20 in the morning. But all of a sudden, they started coming in, and the coffee was made. And I was amazed at how it became a big subject of discussion. People were trying to figure out who, how this was happening. And then I got a little nervous, you know, because I didn't know if I should be doing that or not. But I figured it out pretty soon. People were very happy with it. And then I went on to doing other things. You know, when I got there in the morning, we had a thing called the confinement report. In the military, since there's no bail, you have to have a report every morning to the commander on who is in jail and why. And I started doing that. Well, there came a time when they figured out it was me. And I became 
instantly celebrated, beloved, and so on and so forth for something that was so innocuous to me. And that's the point. The, the idea is, is you even if you are the new person there, even if you are don't have as much experience as others, you can be useful if you make, make up your mind to do so. So just kind of a, a note. And I, years later, I benefited from doing that. My performance reports while I was at that, that duty station were all top notch. Um, later, I could rely on, on people that had worked with me to give me references. This became very important when I applied to law school back in the late 70s because in those days, it was hard to get into law school. So all of this came back. It's, it's a kind of serendipity, really. The idea that, that you have things that are positive that occur, uh, you know, as an unintended consequence of things. You know, we usually think of the law of unintended consequences as something bad, like you you buy a new sports car and then you find out that the insurance is really high. But the, it works the other way too, and that's serendipity. And what I've learned is, is that these unexpected positive results, that they actually aren't as serendipitous as you might think. It's a consequence of making good decisions and trying to do the right things and the good things. So when you get there, uh, in that first job and thereafter, try to find a way to be useful. It may be, there may be big payoffs down the road. Um, another thing, and, and this was something that I, I had to work on a lot uh, w when I was in training, is to work and play well with others. The idea is, is that when you get into a, an office, for example, it has its own culture. And there are offices which, it, they are very harmonious, where you know, it's a kind of place where everybody wants to go to work that day. And so the point being, you know what the opposite is. Most people have been countered at one time or the other, working at a place where they dreaded to go every day. And let's face it, with all the work you put in, graduates, and everything, you want to get into an environment and work in, a, work in a type of work where you want to go there every day. And, and that's really what I think of when I teach, is I want to give people the skills to be able to, to go into any number of situations and be happy with what they're doing, to really enjoy it, to be really glad that they got into this career field. But you've got to learn to work and play well with others. Um, my mother, who was a longtime secretary before I persuaded her to go to college, and, uh, and she later became a paralegal, um, she was the master of, of how to be highly regarded in the workplace wherever she went. And for one thing, she worked hard to avoid conflict. She did not ever contribute to gossip. She listened to it, but she didn't contribute to it. And she was careful. She was cautious about discussing personal matters on the job or uh, debating issues on the job or giving you know, strong opinions about things that were outside of the work. She was, she was a master at it. And uh, the other thing was, if she could be of help to another person and they needed it, she always was happy to do it. Uh, you know, I worry sometimes in today's culture that I've, I've heard people talk about going off on someone. That is, doing things like just walking off a job or, or having a tantrum or that sort of thing. Uh, in the workplace. This is not good. And if you're inclined that way, you need to give a lot of thought to the fact that you're working in an area where you need, where you're supposed to be helping people. Remember, the client is what it's all about. 
And sometimes clients may say things that you don't like to hear. It's kind of like if somebody's in the hospital and you go visit them. They're not at their best at that point. Uh, you know, they're not fixed up. They're not well groomed. They're they're concerned about their condition. They're not feeling well. They have no privacy. So they're not at their best. Well, people in crisis with legal matters have the same situation. So my point is, it's not about you if you're representing clients. It's about them. And you're supposed to contribute to helping those people, not judging them. It's not your job. Good things sometimes take time. You know, one of the things about the world today, whether it's in law or anything else, is everything is faster. And we expect everything to be faster. I can remember being in, an, in a line at an ATM and watching someone get upset because it was taking more than 30 seconds or 40 seconds to get the money out of the machine. And I, I would get the grins about this and say, man, you ought to have seen what it was like before there were ATMs, where you had to go into the bank, you had to write a check, you got looked at with great suspicion uh, by the bank teller, you know, this sort of thing. And now everything is faster, it's more efficient, but some things still take time. It takes time to develop yourself is a top line paralegal. It doesn't happen overnight. And so one, there's many ways to get where you want to go, but sometimes you just have to be patient. I remember I had a uh, lawyer who worked for me. He came into the office one day and he wanted to talk to me about getting a raise. And I said, okay, have at it. Tell me what you, tell me what you want to tell me. And he said, well, I've been here six months. And I said, well, okay, uh, is that it? You know, I mean, it, it, are, are you a net plus or a net minus? And he, I, you know, he brought no evidence with him. He didn't develop any evidence to be able to show that this person should be advanced, should make more money. And finally, he said to me, he said, well, I found out that there are paralegals in the firm who are making more than I am. Now, keep in mind, he had graduated number one in his class in law school, which I could care less about. And I said, well, his name was Ronnie. And I said, well, Ronnie, that's true. I don't usually talk about what each person makes, but that is true. And the reason that is true is because they're more valuable than you are. There's many ways to create value. And if you are the person that always you know, finds a way to contribute, gets along with the clients, gets along with coworkers, is willing to help their, their, their coworkers, um, that it's the kind of person you don't want to leave the workplace. That's a value and that's how you move forward and how you have a trajectory for a great career. Um, be on the lookout for mentors. I am very fortunate to have had great mentors. And one of them I want to mention just as an example. And his name is Dan Garza. And he was my training officer when I was a paralegal student. And basically, uh, you know, there were training officers assigned to monitor the progress uh, of, uh, of, of students in terms of their studying, uh, their testing, uh, their on-the-job training performance, and so on and so forth. And I will tell you, I needed a lot of work. You know, I wasn't familiar with offices, really. I, you know, my idea of what a loft should be like is Perry Mason, you know, Dallas Street and, and the, uh, the detective there. And uh, it was quite different. Um, but one thing that really got to me 
one day was we, we would take these tests and to go to a, ne a new section, you had, to, you had to pass the test. You had to make an 85, I think it was. And I think I made an 87. And I was feeling good about myself because, you know, I, I passed the test. Until Sergeant Dan Garza told me that, no, I was going to need to take it over. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's not good enough. I said, it's, it, it, it's over in 85. He said, well, that's, that's, not, that's not satisfactory to me. And I got very upset, like, what, what's going on here? This is not right. And he said, let me tell you something. I don't want an 85% pilot flying the plane I'm in. I don't want an 85% surgeon operating on me. I don't want an 85% paralegal working with me. He said, so that's the way it's going to be. And, you know, I acted in a pretty predictable way being, you know, 18, 19 years old. I hated the guy, okay? I mean, I felt I was being treated so unfairly. But I found out that in the long run, he, he was so correct especially with me. He forced me to develop a discipline to study, to not be satisfied unless I got the highest possible grade I could get, not based on, not based on complaining to get a grade or chiseling to get a grade, but having to pass an objective test. And as a result, I ended up doing much better uh, in the paralegal field that I ever dreamed that I would have. I got some of the primo jobs you could get as a military paralegal. And uh, it turned out to be a, a defining experience for me. So mentors can make a lot of difference. Um, I've had many others. Um, and, uh, but Dan Garza is just one example. An unyielding, demanding, of excellence sort of person. And sometimes that really gets to people. But think about it. That don't you think most people would be better off for at least encountering someone like that? Someone that took that point of view? It sure worked for me. So now not all mentors are like Dan Garza. Um, he, was, he was tough and made no apologies for it. There are a lot of mentors who give you insight into into how to deal with clients. There's one lawyer uh, that I mentored, and I have to really admire her because her way about doing things is so much different than mine. And I, I use this as an illustration because there's all different kinds of lawyers by personality, outlook, devotion, that sort of thing. But I have always been more of a clinical type of person. I, I, I try to solve problems and I focus on the problem and want to leave the client better off than, than before they met me. But I'm not a touchy-feely person. But this lawyer that I mentored, it was so admirable. She would hug her clients. She would cry with her clients. I mean, she would just, you know, be with them. Uh, it was kind of like having a doctor hold your hand while you're in the hospital, this sort of thing. And it was an incredible thing to see her. And I have to, I have to confess, uh, when I had a, a situation where I had a client that I thought was going to go into crisis while we were in court, I had her go down there with me because she would go into a, in a, in a small conference room and they would cry together and she would hug the client and that sort of thing. And it made a real difference. So she taught me, I mentored her, but she taught me the notion that sometimes it's, it can be very important to not be totally clinical, to work towards being more human about uh, helping the client. So you gotta, you gotta strike that balance, but at the same time, people are different. I am different in my approach than, than you know, some lawyers are, uh, and uh, so, the thing is, is you have to work within that. Keep in mind that there are, there are areas of law where, you know, basically 
you're focused on achieving specific goals and you don't necessarily have to hug anybody to do it. Okay. Finally, avoid making decisions when you're angry and do not burn bridges. I have had more benefit in my life by recommendations from people I have worked with and studied under as a student than I could have ever dreamed of. And so I, I try to follow this rule. I'm not telling you I don't ever lose my temper. It's happened. Uh, the uh, one day I was upset and I went in and started scolding one of my classes. Uh, and while I was in the midst of doing it, another instructor stuck her head in the door and said, Mr. Swanson, that's my class. So you can imagine how that felt. Uh, so it's not a good idea to make decisions when you're angry. What I do is that I, I give it a day, give it 24 hours, and then think about it. In almost every case, it altered what I thought I was going to do the day before. I hope that these suggestions and commentary have been useful to you. I wish you the greatest of luck. And I want to conclude with this. You have been achieving at an exceptional time. And many of you under, under very difficult, difficult circumstances. The the pandemic that we have faced, the difficulties and uncertainties and, and, and worries and family members who have been affected and all this, I can't even begin to imagine what some of you have gone through. So a, a special congratulations to you for achieving in a time in which it was very difficult to achieve. Good luck and God bless. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. At this point in the graduation ceremony, we present a plaque to our featured speaker, thanking him or her for their time and expertise in addressing our graduates. This is usually a 30 second presentation. But first, I want to share some background information with you about Mrs. Swanson that I think you will enjoy. I can't promise that what I'm going to tell you will hold up in court but it is how I remember it. It was early 1987 that Mrs. Swanson answered an ad we put in the Houston Chronicle looking to hire an instructor for our newly licensed paralegal college. We had interviewed quite a few attorneys already, but couldn't find the one we were looking for. Then, Mr. Swanson came in for his interview and he was impressive. I remember him saying early on in that interview that he really did not like school. And when his buddies went off to college, he needed to find something else to do. There was a war going on. The draft was in effect. So he decided to enlist in the United States Air Force instead of waiting around to get drafted. In the Air Force, things changed. During basic training, he said he came across a sergeant who was trying to find recruits to enter their paralegal training program that was about to start. Specialized training in the military is among the finest training in the world. This piqued his interest. There was a stumbling block though. They required a four year degree to be accepted into the program. Fortunately for Mr. Swanson, many who had earned a four year degree during that time were shying away from the military and they couldn't fill up the class. So after taking a battery of tests, he was awarded a remaining seat. He said the training was rigorous and the great thing about it was that the students didn't have an option to not learn. He loved it. At the end of the one year training program, he was ranked number one in the class. Commendations and award ceremonies followed. Remember, he was the only one who didn't have a college degree. For most of us, excelling in an environment like that, under those conditions, could have been a career highlight. But for him, he was just starting. After four years in the Air Force working as a paralegal investigator in the Far East, he set his sights on becoming an attorney. Upon discharge, he was on with 48 months of the GI Bill benefits to help him do that. And he did. 
He spent under two years at the University of Florida to earn an undergraduate degree, and then was on to South Texas College of Law to learn his doctorate in jurisprudence. The 48th month of the GI Bill covered the cost of taking the bar review course and sitting for the bar exam. Incredible. I asked him why he's applying for a teaching position. He said, uh, I'm an attorney. The more opportunities I had to stand in front of a group of people to sway them to my way of thinking, the better attorney I will be. Uh, we found the instructor we were looking for. Mr. Swanson came in two weeks before our first class was scheduled to start and design his syllabus, course outlines, and lesson plans for each class. There were no paralegal books to speak of at that time, but I remember one about paralegalism. It was more than an inch thick, small print, and no pictures. On February 23rd, 1987, our first class started. No book. There were 16 morning students and 10 evening students. Classes were held on campus. Students were captivated, and it was the end of May before we had the first absence. We were in our offices that first day of class, and about every 10 to 15 minutes, we could hear the class burst out in laughter. It was really an incredible experience. Rules and standards that were placed in effect during that first year are still running true today. That military training that Mr. Swanson brought with him lives on. All of you in this graduating class had many highly qualified instructors that you raved about in your course reviews. They are occurring on the foundation Mr. Swanson set this many years ago. We know that combining outstanding instructors with really bright students like yourselves usually works out pretty well. What I remembered about those early days was not only said to recognize Mr. Swanson, but also to compliment each of you for the terrific job you did and successfully completing a paralegal program of this stature. You should be proud of your accomplishments and certainly humble enough to thank those who stood by you as you progress through your program. Good job, everyone. We want to thank Mr. Swanson for the enormous contribution he has made to the success of Center for Advanced Legal Studies and to his graduates and to the legal communities we serve. He has been a pillar in our traditional on-campus classes since our inception. But I noticed on the schedule, he is scheduled to teach criminal law online next term for those of you moving to the associate degree program. So it's time to get back to the 30 second presentation. Mr. Swanson, please accept this plaque as a token of our appreciation for addressing our graduates today and for the many years you have dedicated yourself to the legal profession and to preparing our graduates to excel as legal professionals. You have made a difference. Thank you. It is my pleasure to provide individual recognition to each of our graduates. They leave us today with credentials that will never expire, and they have earned permanent membership as Cal's alumni. We will first acknowledge the graduates who are awarded a paralegal certificate. Donna P. Adiso. Flor Marina Aguilar, Achieving Lex. Jessica Nenneth Anderson. Kimberly Avina. Letitia R. Baker. Brandy Nicole Barnes. Emily Springs Beckett. Kelly Marie Bennett, Achieving Lex. Tapasio Boyd. Lawrence Brown. Kara Elizabeth Cabo, achieving Lex and honors.
Hannah Marie Carrington. Ashley Tracy Ann Carswell. Jose Yole Centeno. Kimberly Chevelis Campos. Lakeisha A. Collins, Achieving Lex. Danita Colquitt, Achieving Lex and Honors. Rhonda Daniels. Joshua Adele Day. Darius Dyer. Quint D. Irwin. Michelle R. Freytag, Achieving Lex. Darina A. Gali. Maria E. Fajardo Gonzalez. Laura K. Guillen, Achieving Lex and Honors. Laura Caitlin Guthrie. Shantae U. Hampton. Betsy G. Hansen. Shaylin Hardin, Achieving Lex. Bishara S. Harrison. Heather Hook, Achieving Lex and Honors. Kalana Nicole Hudgens, Achieving Lex and Honors. Shatoria N. Hunt. Rosal Nori Hussein. A. Renee Johnson, Achieving Lex and Honors. Christy Lynn Johnson. June Jones, Achieving Lex. Lakeisha Melissa Jones. Melinda King, Achieving Lex and Honors. Ashley Nicole Klinger. Shamitria Lede Weibel. Anita Lazrado. Javon Lavant. Amanda Lynn Luera, Achieving Lex. Janice Ivory McKinney. Samantha Jasmine Montoya. Megan Elizabeth Neal.
Stephanie Gomez Neville. Nathaniel Pope. Jasmine Qualls. Katiushka Vargas Ramirez. Hema Ramnarin. Vanessa J.D. Reyes. Hannah R. Scobie Jording, Achieving Lex. Anna V. Navas Sejas, Achieving Lex and Honors. Beulah Malad Sikiang. Emily Ann Stockdale. Erin Nicole Tate. Angela Elaine Thomas, Achieving Lex and Honors. Lindsay Sydney Thomas, Achieving Lex. Daniel Alexander Tian, Achieving Lex and Honors. Megan Tillman. Teresa Tran. Henry Vernon, Achieving Lex and Honors. Catherine M. Villaranga. Mercedes K. Watler. Graduates who are being awarded an Associate of Applied Science in Paralegal Studies are as follows. Joanna Roxana Alex. Connie Louise Bernal. Tia Cashaw. Kristen Myra Contreras. Christopher J. Duncan II. Kimberly Diane Fountain. Cassandra Garcia. Allison K. Green, Achieving Lex. Elizabeth Heflin, Achieving Lex. Mary Ann Grace Lozano. Courtney Mouton. Claudia Eliza Ochoa. Afton Elizabeth Pearlstein, Achieving Lex. Melanie Ramos. Cindy Karen Rico. Nicole Marie Rittner.
Matthew J. Slife. Lashavia Denise Tutson. Kathy Irene White. Jennifer N. Wiggins. Patricia Sherelle Wright. Each of you came to us with aspirations about what education could make possible and with dreams about how your lives would be changed. Our hope is that you remain steadfast in the knowledge that your training, the relationships you made, the learning you achieved, and the experiences you had during your time at CALS will serve you well. Thank you for participating in our 67th commencement. We congratulate each of you for completing your studies and earning your certificates and degrees. We hope you have many more happy achievements and extend our very best wishes for your future success. Congratulations.